I mean, but I don't think we could really tell when the rocks were out that big. Yeah. Hey, Alan, come on in. Yeah, you might come back knee high to mud after that. I'd say it's probably about two two foot left. Then you thought about when I looked at the lines on the poles, maybe two feet. One of the pipes will be underwater, I think. Don't you think that one closest to it, which won't hurt it, I don't think, but be a good good spot for a catfish. We're going to have hopefully a concert by the end of September, October. I hope we can get some grass going. Yeah. It's really looking good, though. I, not a lot of cattails jump back out. I think we got most of that out of there, the roots and stuff. I think it's – there's a few, but Chris said a few are good. They're good. That's good. You want a few? Hey, Bob. Come on in here. Pull up a chair. Stay a while. What? What? Now you got that big grin on your face. This is stuff for Brittany. Oh, thanks. Yep. Something wrong with it though. There's nothing in it. I guess uh I guess you have to tell her it's broken. Put something in it. I can do that. Tell her to fix it. Let's have a crack in it. Spaghetti fell out. Yeah, she uses that for a lot of things. Yeah. Spaghetti and breads. Well, hey Sam. Come on in here. How are you doing? Good to see you. I like that vest. Pull up a seat. Well, these, these boys will go to, they're going to go to youth class in a little bit. <clears throat> Quarantine. Yeah. yeah. How many days? Nine days. That's proof you've been eating those donuts. Yeah. Yeah. We caught you. <laughs> Welcome to our YouTubers. Yeah. We'll get started here in about three or four minutes. Hang in there. Yeah, I didn't get that kind of, I just had my knee replaced. Yeah. I don't know how to invite it. 
All right, guys, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 15 to start off today. If you need a Bible, I got Bibles. I got big print Bibles. You can read them across the room. Well, that's what we need. I got some yeah. cheaters in it. Oh, yeah. That's some, some big Bibles there. Those. Yeah. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 15. That's not up there. No, I'm going to do this for a review and then erase it so we can kind of catch up to where we were last week. Hey, Matt. Good to see you, buddy. Come on in here and stay. Stay a while as I tell them. All right. Yeah, 15. First Corinthians 15. Here come the Lauks in. Everybody's assembling. Slowly but surely. Welcome to our YouTubers. Glad you guys are on board. I know they always look dirty, don't they? <laughs> Need a tissue? I'll get it for you. You got it? All right. All right. How's the work week, Matt? Everything going okay? Uh, yeah, just fine. Right. Being safe? Oh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Yes, we are. Made it. Yeah. He drove a straight line all the way here from his house. <laughs> Didn't go in a circle or anything, did you, when you came here? Actually, yeah, I had it. Well, I had Oh, did you? Yeah, you were going the wrong way. Uh, preschool for Annabelle. Yeah. It's a little place over there beside the prosecutor's office across the street. It's a new, I don't think it's a new lady. I think it's just a new spot, I guess. But she didn't take very many. So we're thankful to get her in. So, yeah. Yeah, that starts September. So. Mama's got to get all the tears out, you know. I'm 
Okay, guys. We'll get started with a word of prayer and then we'll we'll dive in. I wanna uh hey Daniel, you wanna get the doors for us? Generally we get a which is a good thing. We get a lot of a lot of excitement about ten minutes before class is over. Good deal. He's in the restroom. Yeah, you can you can leave it open for him if you want. I, I don't want to I don't want to keep Butch out. Sorry. Yeah. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for everyone that's out today. Thank you for your church. Thank you for differences, but yet how you bring us together in you in unity. Uh and we do it because of Jesus. We, we have that mutual love and admiration and worship for our Lord. And you're the reason we're here, Lord. So be honored by what we say, do, and think this morning. Continue to help Butch to get back to his wanted hell. Thank you for um, bringing Bob back to his health enough to be with us today at church. And Lord, we just thank you for all the many rich, wonderful blessings you give to us. Uh, Lord, continue to lead and guide us according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we we just started a study last week. It was just an overview, so you're here at the perfect time. So you didn't miss much. Uh, we've been talking about why go to church. And the reason we're doing that is because we looked at in Ephesians 4 that Paul said, you did not learn Christ that way. And what he was talking about is not just what you learn about Christ, but how you learn about Christ. There are ways that we teach. Remember, we looked at Luke 7, and in Luke 7, Jesus said, we played a dirge for you. In other words, a funeral music, and you didn't like that. And then we played dancing music. Flutes were playing, and everybody should have been dancing, and you didn't like that. In other words, nothing made you happy. We were, you were sharing the gospel with you, and nothing seemed to appeal to you, so you just threw the whole thing out. You didn't like it. And these were the Pharisees he was talking to. You know, it's just some people, you know, they just seem like they're sucking on lemons, aren't they? You know, they, they, they just can't seem to be happy about worship at all. Their church, you know, hey, I didn't get anything out of that church and so on. And sometimes the question isn't, why didn't we get anything out of church? It's why didn't you put anything into it? You know, that kind of thing. You got to be invested in church. You got to be you got to be willing to get involved and be. We all know that. But but since COVID, we have found an interesting thing has happened. A hundred churches a day are closing in the United States. A hundred churches a day. And that trend is just growing. One third of regular church uh, attenders aren't going back to church. 33% aren't returning. And this trend of online churches has really taken off. People just want to stay home in their robes and drink their coffee at home and tune into their favorite preachers. And that has become a substitute for church. Now, you might say, well, our church is doing okay, and we are. We've, we've done well through the COVID. I'm thankful to God we're still here, let alone doing well. But you know what? Our kids, I've got two boys in ministry. They're going to have a tough road to hold because this thing is just getting worse, not better. And they're going to have to answer the question. And maybe you're going to need to answer it to your nephews and nieces and grandchildren and you know so on. You might need to answer that. Why do I need to go to church? I used to see a t-shirt walking around. People were printing them out. I'm not, let's see, I don't go to church. I am the church. Now, what do they mean by that? That's an accurate statement. They are the church. And so going to church doesn't make you a Christian, does it? But to be a Christian, can you not go to church? I don't think so. So we talked about being a Christian and living it uh, last week. To live out your Christian walk, you got to go to church. But to be a Christian, no, you can be a Christian. You can you can know Jesus. You can get in your Bibles and praise Him and pray. And you can even get online and just pick, you know, listen to Charles Stanley. And I recommend him far more than me. I'd listen to Charles Stanley before me every day in 
twice on Tuesday, right? But that's not the substitute. God's word is very clear. We should go to church. So I started to ask these questions, and we, we looked at 700 to 800 AD. There was a big fight over whether or not churches should have icons, pictures, stained glass windows, pretty colors, archwork, pretty woodworking, uh, lighting, uh, bands, music, pianos, organs, orchestras. Uh, should they have smelly stuff in there? Pretty smelling stuff like flowers. Ooh, right? My friend Brian says the most unchristian thing a church could ever do is to have fake flowers. Why does he say that? God made those flowers to smell good and to be uh, that, that aroma of the, of, the, of the smells. So, all right, let's start over. We looked at Philippians 8, which um, uh, let me just read it real quick for you. Uh, last, just to review, I just want to make sure we're all together on this because this is going to take us a few weeks. He said in verse 8 of Philippians 4, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Now, he's talking, uh, obviously, about our spiritual walk with Christ, but icons can, it seems, elicit a good attitude. Um, have you ever, I wrote a lot of examples down, but is there anything that when you see it, it makes you happy? Is there anything when you smell it, it makes you happy? Is there anything when you hear it, it just makes you happy? Is there anything that you touch or feel with your hands that you just like it? It's just, maybe it's even just lotion on your hands. Oh, I got dry, cracked skin. Oh, that feels so good. Is there, is there anything that you taste that just makes your taste buds do the hallelujah chorus? There is. I see a lot of heads shaking as I said that. Your brains are working, right? You're thinking, yeah, that's something I really like. Will it be the same for all of us? Now, this is the question. Will we all agree on what makes all five of those senses excitable? Believe it or not, I'm going to say when it comes to church, yes. Now, I know you get two Baptists in a room, you have three opinions. I know that. I absolutely know it because one's just going to change their mind back and forth, right? So you're going to have three opinions. But there are some things that God put in us that we do share in common. Now, this is where it starts to get difficult. So 1 Corinthians 15, if you want to look that up. Um, by the way, in that fight they had over whether we should have icons or not, icons won. That's why you have ornamental stuff in churches today. But then you'll drive through the country and you'll find you a little country church and you'll walk in black and white, green pews, been there for 100 years, never going to change the color. Doesn't matter if there's holes in it or not. It's going to stay the same. There are, there's no special woodworking, nothing. You guarantee there's no mural up front, right? You can imagine the fights they had when they started putting murals of, the, of baptism. Remember, they you, you could go in some churches and see river scenes. You ever seen those in some churches? Oh, our church, even in Paducah, I remember we had somebody who was a, a really famous artist who did the uh, murals down on the riverfront. And we had them come do a, a dove coming and descending right above the baptistry. Well, that was the shot heard around the town. There were a lot of people that said, they are ruining that church. They put a picture of a dove. Well, where do we learn there's a dove that came down at Jesus' baptism? In the Bible. But it was, hey, you can't be doing that stuff. Okay, all right. Well, let's let's take, a, let's go to a little different. I see Annabelle and Emma are helping me with my smiley faces. So I hope you're smiling. 1 Corinthians 15 
<clears throat> look at what this says, starting with verse, uh, oh, we'll start with verse 25. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy will be abolishing death. Won't that be great? Now watch what it says. Verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 15. All right. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet, but when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is expected who put all things in subjection to him. All right. Watch verse 28. When all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him so that God may be all in all. Otherwise, um, what will those do who are baptized for the dead and the dead who are raised at all? Then why are they baptized for them? Now watch verse 30. Why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If from human motives fraught or fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me if the dead are not raised? Okay, wait a minute. He's going to start talking about dead people raising. That's going to be us, isn't it? Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die if nobody's raised, basically is what he's saying. So what difference does it make? But then he says in verse, 30, uh, verse 33, do not be uh, deceived. Bad company corrupts good moral. Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning for some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But someone will say, how are, you, how are the dead raised? I want to know how dead people get up. What are they going to look like? Okay, Paul said, I'll answer that. How are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? Did you know you're going to get a body when you're raised up from the dead? You're not going to be cast for the ghost. Ooh, you know, people joke all the time. I'll come back and haunt somebody. Well, no, you're not. That's not what's going to happen. You're going to be raised with a body. This is really key, guys. Verse 36. You fool. That which sows. I mean, we got a farmer here. So... Guys, we, um, no excuses. Farmer sees this all the time, right? Farmer family, you fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow for the body, which is to be, but a bare, watch this, but a bare grain, just a grain, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished, and each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, another flesh of fish. Now, verse 40. There are also heavenly bodies. Look at this. Heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another. Wow, look at these talking about terrestrial bodies like what we have now and celestial bodies like um, angelic bodies. Were angels able to be seen? Were they able to be touched? Were they able to pick things up? Were they able to do? Yeah, sure. When Jesus was resurrected, he was said to have a resurrected body. Could he eat? Yeah. Could he drink? Yeah. Could he be grabbed? Yes. But could he walk through walls and vanish and show up where he wants? Yep, he could do that too, right? Did they not see him ascending into heaven? How could you see somebody ascending unless they had a visual, visible body, right? Okay. There are There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, and different. Okay. So the heavenly bodies we see are stars, moons, and so on as well. Can you see the moon? Can you see the stars? Are they actually physical? Sure. Yeah. Now they might be burning or ice. They might be ice or fire, but they're still visible and tangible. I mean, get close enough to the sun, you'll know just how tangible it is, right? You won't exist, but it will. So it's more, you know, real than we are, isn't it? The sun is real. So watch verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised to what? An imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. There's the word again. You think Paul's trying to get something across to us here? 
the word body, I think he's trying to get this across to us. It is raised a spiritual body. Is there a natural body? There is also a spiritual body. Now, first thing you might say, I'm going to write this up here on the board. You might say, this is a contradiction in terms. All right? If we put a spirit, I'm just going to shorten it a little bit, a spiritual body. Okay? There you go. Spiritual body. Does that seem like a contradiction to you? Because when you think of spiritual, what do you think about? Something spiritual. Yeah, may, maybe I'm maybe I'm stretching here. Yeah, yeah, it's it's spirit. We worship God in spirit and truth. Bible says God is is spirit. So I think of something kind of invisible, but yet I can kind of maybe feel it, maybe, but I can't grab it. I can't hug it. I can't do something with it. But then he throws in the word body. Now, what do you think of when you think of a body? I can touch it, right? I can feel with it. <clears throat> I can experience things with it, right? So isn't this interesting? Um, so here's what I think happens a lot of times, and we'll get more into this over the next few weeks. When you go to a funeral, you always hear people, we talked about this last week, everybody's like, well, they're in heaven, they're doing great, and the eulogy is just, they're with Jesus, and everything's great and wonderful, because we want to immediately try to guess that they're doing wonderful and great, and everything's going wonderful, and we do know that you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. We know that for those that trust in Christ, but the Bible speaks far more about the future resurrection than it does about the state of a Christian that dies now. In fact, we go to a cemetery and it seems so, I don't know, it just doesn't, depressing. depressing. I mean, they're going to leave our loved one out here in this cemetery, in a box, in a, in a hole, and gosh, can we talk about where they are right now? You know, and you know what we normally neglect? What's coming? I try to read 1 Corinthians 15. I've done maybe 100 funerals and, and I try to read 1 Corinthians 15. Maybe 200, but I I try to remind people there's a day coming when they have a resurrected body and they'll be huggable and tangible. Yeah. Okay, some have heard this story, but my father was very crippled. He yeah. was in a wheelchair. Yeah. He could not communicate. And after he passed away, just a couple, three weeks, yeah. I was in bed at night and I woke up to the feeling that somebody was in the bedroom with us. Yeah. And I thought I better open up my eyes and see what's going on. And there at the end of the bed stood my father straight and tall. Yeah. Which we, I think that was something that maybe God blessed you with to give you this, to know that dad's okay because of what you knew in the word of God, dad's okay. Same thing happened with, with my mom that they were okay. But in my case, my mom was standing at the end of the bed and it was a horrible sight. What I saw, it was, a, it was the most horrific. Uh, it, what I saw was just the worst sight. Of, Stephen King could not come up with what I saw. Yeah. And I don't. His old self. Yeah. And he was his old self. Right. So there are we have to be careful with visible because we walk by faith, not by sight. Uh, but I get what you're saying there, that we we do have the hope of their wholeness and that we're when we see them again, we'll see them whole. We'll see them whatever whole is in the in heaven. Right. Whatever that is uh, with the new heaven and the new earth. Now, I already gave it away. When the Bible talks about heaven, we really talk more about a new heaven and a new earth. Do You know that our hope is actually a new earth. Right. A new heaven and a new earth. Everything's made new. Is so when Peter says that the world's going to be wiped out with fire, is it going to be uh, annihilated? Is it going to be um, gone? Is that what the fire is going to do? Like the earth will be gone? I hear this quite a bit. Well, it doesn't really matter what I do because it's, I'm just going. It's going to be burned up in the end. You ever hear that, people? It's all just going to be destroyed with fire. Is it going to be destroyed? 
with fire? Well, when the flood came, did it destroy the earth? Or did it destroy the living things on the earth? Cleansed it. That's right. It's a cleansing. God has no intention on this globe, this earth, going away. He's just going to cleanse it with fire. That's what fire does, right? It purges. We've got to get out of our mindset in order to do this study about church, believe it or not. This is going to help us about how to do church. We've got to get it out of our mind that that God is going to drop some kind of celestial nuclear bomb and the whole thing is going to explode like on the movies. You know how a planet in Star Wars or something will just go off into particles, right? I remember a Star Wars scene. I don't remember which one, but they flew to a spot where they were supposed to find a planet. And when they got there, they started getting hit by, they thought that they were in a meteor storm or something, but it actually was the pieces of the planet because it had been blown up, right? And we get this thing in our head that this planet is going to go away. It is never going away. This planet is forever. So don't believe the people that say that we have the power to destroy it. We do not have the power to destroy it, and it will not be destroyed. Do you think that like yeah. how, your, how your church is closing every day is, is a cleansing? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the... the the lukewarm being spit out, the hundred churches closing. Yes. Yes. I will say it this way. I think that there were a great many people that didn't really want to go to church anyway. And once COVID hit, it was the excuse they needed and they got out of the habit and they honestly are having their hearts exposed to what they really thought about going to church to begin with. I think it's a revelation of sorts of where the church in our country had gotten to. And it reflects leadership of churches, as I wrote an article in Facebook about, I think it falls squarely at the feet of leadership of churches. We have not taught or demonstrated sacrificial Christ-like living. The reason why we come to church, now we have uh, done anything but unify, we have only disunified in the way we lead churches today. And what happened? We didn't need each other anymore. COVID came. I don't need you. You don't need me. We don't need it because churches were done in a way where you came in and you just sit back, you viewed, you went home. No one knew where anybody was with the Lord. There was no personal touch. We, we distanced ourselves from everyone. I'll, I'll be honest, and this is hard to say because of the way I was brought up in my church. You know what? When we went to church long before COVID, we still had our special spotted special pew. And, and we sat in this spot. You sat in that spot. Oh, hey, how y'all doing? And we just come over here. There was no embracing. There was no hugs. In the Bible, they greeted each other with kisses. Now, in our culture, we greet each other with nice firm handshake or how you doing? Right? There was none of that. So we were, you know, we social distanced before there was social distancing. We kept apart. And churches just kind of got used to that. And they kept their distance. I have my spot. You have your spot. And in our church, when I first got here, there was a young couple that came to visit. And thankfully, they're still with us. And they could tell the story if they want to. They came to our church and they sat down for the first Sunday to be here. And a family in the church came and moved them and said, hey, you're sitting in our spot. And they moved the young couple to another place in the church and said, no, we sit here. And thankfully, they were tough enough that they could take it and they came back. But yeah, we, we, we have a lot of that. This is my spot. That's your spot, right? Not a whole lot of, I mean, crowding up front, right? You're not going to see that. And I get it. Um, it's, it is because people want to have access to the bathrooms or they want to get out or Maybe they want to get to lunch a little quicker. I don't know, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, Sam. I think a lot of this has happened yeah. during my lifetime. Yes. When I was growing up, mm -hmm. neighbors visited each other. My mom and dad, we'd go to the neighbors and play cards. And yeah. Us kids all play together. Yep. 
Sam, you're up. In your lifetime, you have seen the rocking chairs move from the front porch to the back porch to not at all now. You've seen the whole cycle. That's a, that's a chapter in a book I read. Rocking chairs move to the back porch. They're not even on the back porch anymore. Used to be we had time and people would wander over to their neighbors and you touched each other. I don't mean in a, don't, 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 don't take me wrong, but you, you embraced each other. You were in each other's space. You shared, you knew what was going on in each other's lives. Now you might as well live, you know, we joke all the time, even with your families. Uh, Brittany and I joke about this. We probably would see her family more if we lived out of town and came and visited for a week, right? That's nothing against anyone. It's just how busy everybody is. This is the busiest town I've ever lived in. I have never just try to lead youth in this town and see what happens. Look, you plan an event and they'll have eight other things to do and they'll gear on whether or not that one's better than this one. Used to be, used to be the church youth group. That's all there was. You didn't go, there wasn't anything else to do. And if you really wanted to have fun, you came to church, right? And we were so good at that. Oh, the church was so good at that. But now there's eight other choices. They're, they're, they've got a hundred things going on Sunday morning, Wednesday night. They got a hundred things going on, right? Yeah, that's right. Churches. Yep. Schools yeah, that's right. The school. That's exactly right. That was a big, it was a big thing in our town. Hey, could y'all just stay off a of Wednesday night? And it was great night to make up rain outs. So they started doing games on Wednesday. Then we had our little league started doing games on Sunday morning, gutted the youth ministries. When you go ask anybody, even the one that was the biggest, I think they had two or three hundred youth over at uh, our, our friends, Craig Howie's church over here at Lebanon Christian. Just ask them what's happened to their youth group. Guys, they're all just broke up. All of them. You, you're not going to find. So what a church is going to have to do is start asking some hard questions, some really hard questions. We're going to have to make some sacrifices. Mike, I got one Fred that they asked him point blank, what are we going to do with 33% not coming back to church and 100 churches a day? What are we going to do? And he said, I'd say panic. You know, and he, <laughs> he he's funny because he, he was being funny. But he said, yeah, I'd say take a sedative and panic probably. That's probably what I would do. And we are in a tough spot here. We're in a tough spot. Our next youth group in this church is going to be the kids of the parents we have now, because we have 14 kids that come here. They're all going to grow up. And we're going to have a youth group if the parents stay committed. Right. But used to be the parents were committed. They didn't send their kids to church. They took their kids to church. But what we were running into there for a couple of decades and the church youth groups were pretty big. All the parents just sent their kids. Now, those kids are parents. Right. And those they're not sending their kids. It, it's it, that whole generation then stopped it because those parents weren't coming. So they send them to a different church. Yeah. Where they have a good youth group, church right? The church of the soccer league. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. When you're right. And I used to drive the church van. We picked up nine to 10 kids a morning. Yeah. None of them come here now. No, no. And they don't go anywhere now. Look, when when dad goes to church with their kids, 80 percent of the time they end up in a church. I'm not going to blame moms for anything. I'm going to tell you when dads go 80 percent of the time, those kids will be in church when they grow up. We used to pick up the wire children. Mm -hmm. wire, there you go. And then their mom and dad started. There you go. Yeah. And OK, so I've, I've done a whole lot of sort of. I guess you'd say more introduction with you, but we've covered a lot. Um, Luther calls. Uh, well, let me let me see where I let me catch up on my notes here. Um, in a movie, Wyatt Earp, there's this um, there's this scene. It might have been in Tombstone. Yeah, it was in Tombstone. Brittany will know better than I will. But uh, Wyatt Earp was. I don't know, he was standing over the body of, of a guy who was accidentally shot. He had come to town 
to put on plays. And he was, um, he could, he could, he had all these plays he had memorized and he was, you could go to the town hall and he would put on a play for everybody. And his girlfriend or wife, I don't know if his girlfriend or wife, she had this line. He got shot and killed. It was, it was just shrapnel. It was a spray, a spraying bullet. They were shooting at each other and they killed this guy. And she said he tried to bring, she, she said he tried to bring a little beauty into your life and you killed him for it. Now, what a line, what a line. Because what we just read in Philippians 4, 8 challenged us to focus on the lovely things. When we, when we, um, uh, we looked at Ephesians 4, 20 to the end of the chapter, that line about you didn't learn Jesus this way. This is the hardest lesson that I try to teach. It's so difficult, but we're going to have to teach it. We, it would be nice if I could avoid it because it's going to seem like nailing jello to a tree. Like I like to say, it's, it's difficult to teach this to you. It's the duality. It's so difficult. We're talking about spiritual bodies. We're talking about how we learn Christ, not what we learn. Look, if it was what we learned, I could give you a handout today, right? And then tell you what? Take it home and read, Take it home and, read it. and then you can memorize the scriptures and we'll come back next week and we'll get another handout. Well, these days I could text it to you, right? It's not what we learned about Christ. And that's, that's why Ephesians 4 is so important. It's how we learned Christ. How did you learn Christ? Well, you didn't learn Christ that way, Paul said. In other words, the way you're conducting your life does not jive with, that's a good theological word, right? Doesn't jive with what you learned. So he's saying, I didn't tell you these things about Jesus so that you could just go off the deep end in morality, that you could just not do beautiful things. I didn't teach you about Christ so that you wouldn't do what he called, he uses the word good, good things, right? So we would we would say, now he said what's true. Now we know what's true, right? That's the facts of the Bible. What's true, right? What's true is the word of God. What's a lie is what the devil tells us. So we got that down. We know that. We're learning it. We're reading scripture together. But he throws out these other words that we're supposed to think on things that are good and things that are lovely. We might throw the word in there, pure. I think that's a good word, right? Pure. And you know, in Ephesians 4, he even says, not impurities, I didn't teach you Jesus so that you could have impurities in your worship. But I want you to have pure things. So here's the difficult thing. It's not just what we teach and preach, but how we do it. So last week when I preached that sermon, it was probably um, hard for some to follow and others maybe not, but why did I stand up there and say, for those of y'all that heard it, um, that it, you know, troubles are unseen. Then I said they are unhurried. Uh, they are unexplainable. Um, and originally we, we talked about how they were unavoidable. They were unselective and they were unenjoyable. Remember that? I put, I, I had that. Then I said, troubles are tempered by time. Troubles are um, uh, the process, not the, pro, not the, not the uh, purpose. And troubles are always accompanied by opportunities, right? Why an outline? Why something that you could just, why did I do it that way? Why did I lay out an out outline of what I wanted to say out of Psalm 84, 5, and 6? Why did I do that? I could have just given you Psalm 84, 5, and 6, and I could have said, troubles, 
are real and you better pray a lot. And we could have just sang a song and gone home. Why do we have preaching? I mean, homiletics is a whole branch of study about, uh, you know, how to deliver a message. I just study it out. Um, and then hermeneutics is how to study. Homiletics is how I'm, how do I deliver it to you? I call it putting handles on your luggage. Y'all ever have a big thing of luggage and it didn't have a handle on it? It's like a mattress with no, it used to have mattresses didn't have handles on them, right? Trying to carry that thing around. Why did I give you an outline? For those that wanted to, they could fill out the outline and they could take it home and think about it. Maybe you remember a few of the points. Maybe, I don't know. John MacArthur says he has to do a two-part series in one day because no one's going to remember by Tuesday anything he said on Sunday. Well, if that's John MacArthur, then who am I? I know that. But why do that? Well, it's not what I said in that instance, but it's what? How I said it. So I try really hard to serve it to you in a way that's palatable, something that's manageable. Is that a better word? So that you can take it in. It's also, it's yeah. also keeping us from yeah. relying on our own minds because yeah. we don't have the experience and knowledge of the entire word. There you go. There you go. Yeah. And I like that. Your job is yes. to make sure that the conclusions that are derived mm -hmm. are yes. derived from scripture and yeah. not from our own minds. Yes, that's right. So if I'm going to get it yeah. also help us recognize something in our life that sounds like what you're talking about. Yeah, sure. And you can resonate with it. Handle it and get yeah. through it. Yes. Isn't that interesting? I like what y'all said. Those go so well together. Here's the thing. Um, when it flooded, what did God give us when it flooded to say, I have a covenant with you and I'm not going to destroy the world again with water? What did God give us? Rainbow. What's a rainbow look like? Beautiful. Beautiful. All the colors of the spectrum, right? We, we get to see the rainbow, right? Isn't that interesting that God gave us colors in order to remind us of a covenant? Now with me, right? So when you preach, you want it to be palatable. Why do preachers tell stories? I have, I have friends that say, you have no business telling stories. Why? Make it relatable. Yeah, yeah. You got it. It. Wow, that happened to me. Something like that happened to me. Is that what this Bible verse is talking about? Hmm, great. Can stories get out of control? Yes. There are some people that want to tell all stories and read a Bible verse at the end. And, you know, I even know preachers that will tell story, 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 story. And, oh, by the way, y'all go home and read this Bible verse. <laughs> no, that's backwards. Let's. Let's talk about the context of the Bible verse. And then if you want to tell some stories that how, how God has impacted you in your life with these verses, that's great. Uh, so let me give you another one. Okay. Have you ever been snorkeling? Have you ever watched a, have you ever watched a documentary on ocean life? What do you see down there? Dull, black and whites? You lose a lot of color because the sun can't get to it. The sun can't even get to it, right? So if you go to a reef, like a like the Bahamas, they have trips you can take, and it's real shallow, and you can swim along a living reef, and what do you see? You see colors that you could not paint with the greatest canvas and the greatest mixture of paints. You couldn't possibly do that, right? Well, who made those fish? Who made the rainbow, right? Have you ever looked at fruit around the world? Not just fruit here. I was eating fruit that the Leathermans left. I was eating on it all week, and they, they left some fruit for me. <clears throat> I just looked at my, I was doing this study. I was looking at my platter, and I saw pineapple and strawberry, watermelon, two different color grapes. I had green, 
purple, oh yeah, and honeydew, a different shade of green, red, yellow, and a different shade of red with strawberry and watermelon. Who made all that? Whoever made all this stuff loves what? Color. And yet, what do we do a lot of times when we build churches? What do we take out of it? We don't want color. Because if we have color, that could be an idol. Well, you yeah. say that's where the word pure yeah. is almost a contradiction to lovely in, in, in our general beliefs. Yes, in our general beliefs. Yep, that's right. That's what we, we, we make those contradiction in terms. We do. But does it make you happy to see something colorful? Have you ever walked up on a field of flowers? Oh, you should point them out to me. Uh, Sylvia oh. and Butch and I. What's that place? I don't it's on know. 52. As you go into Tippecanoe County on 52, they have yeah. miles of daylilies. Daylilies. Have you seen them? No. Oh, I, I bought the Jonquil field in our neighborhood called Jonquilon. My mom wanted it, so when she died, she left me some money, and I took that money and bought the Jonquil field. That's what mama would want. I'm going to go buy a car. I'm going to go buy the Jonquil field. And it was hard to buy it because the lady that owned it was ahead of the greenhouse in Paducah. And so she said, no, 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 These there are bulbs out there that are worth whatever. I said, get whatever bulbs you want. I don't mind. I'm buying it because every spring, 25,000 Jonquils come up white, yellow, mixtures of whites and yellows. And oh, for, for about six weeks there, you're like, I am close to God. Just sitting here looking at these beautiful different sizes. Uh, unreal. The colors that God can put together, right? Yeah. And yet we might go into a church and we see how many fresh flowers each week. An area one. But at least Easter time, we get to see a couple of flowers, right? At least at Easter, Christmas, you know, my dad used to do this. And I used to think, why are you doing that, dad? And, and he was a smart man. Every Easter, what would he do for my mom? Y'all know, think back. She always had to have her dress on, you know, dress for Easter. And he always had something in the refrigerator waiting Sunday morning. Corsage. He would get it out and it'd be a big, pretty flower. Smelled so good, right? And we would wear that to worship. <sighs> oh, what did we do? Well, we just offended every pioneer and pilgrim that ever lived because they would wear black and white outfits, little black and white bonnets, right? If they did wear suspenders, they had to be black. Right? They had to be careful to wear black pants, black shoes, white shirts. No one stands out. Right? Now I'm picking on color. That's all I'm talking about. Guys, we're going to do this study for a few weeks. I know we just got a couple minutes. But um, let's see if I, oh, I want to give you a childhood memory. Are you ready? First time I went to a Cincinnati Reds ball game. All right? You would think. I would have remembered seeing Pete Rose, Johnny Bench. I was at the Johnny Bench game where he hit it out of the whole stadium. Got the poster. One of my family members tore it up. I had him. It was signed by Johnny Bench, and she shredded it, tore it up, disintegrated it. Yeah. To this day, I have no don't I don't I have no bad feelings about it. You know. <laughs> yeah. Right. <clears throat> when I walked through, there was a tunnel. I can tell you where I was. I was probably seven the first time I walked in and I saw artificial turf. I saw green beyond any green. It was a vibrant green that I had never seen in my life. And to this day, I've been to several ball fields. I've never seen anything like it. Why have I never seen anything like it? Yeah. Right here. Yeah. My, my eyes. I was seven. And when I saw that for the first time, I will never forget it as long as I live. Right. What happened to churches? What happened 
to that experience of coming in and saying, wow, God is being represented here, you know? But I will never forget more than the big red machine, that experience and what I saw, right? Did I get to go on the field and talk to Pete Rose, Concepcion or, you know, Tom Seaver or any of those guys? Nah, I didn't get anywhere close. I guarantee our tickets, we were up, we were up there in Bob Euchre's section, right? We we're in the nosebleed section, right? That's where we were. But I will never forget that because why? Color. God made us all to enjoy color. Look at Butch's shirt. What a great shirt that is. I like it, right? I, I joke with people, don't, don't, don't leave your shirt laying around or whatever. I might take it, right? And that's one of those, right? Great shirt. I told, um, oh gosh, somebody in the church a, a few years ago, man, I really like that shirt. You know what showed up for Christmas? One of those shirts. Okay, Butch, so if you can find me one, I appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm playing with you. But yeah, colors, right? And it's okay not to have a colorful shirt on. That's not my point. But we have things that we enjoy that we all can say are great and lovely. Is anyone, have you ever smelled frankincense? I'm going to just give you a little teaser for next week. Have you ever smelled that smell? You know, it's a big deal in the Bible, right? Frankincense. Have you ever smelt it? I tell you, my big smell is vanilla. How many like vanilla? Oh, cooking with it, smelling with it, lotions. Vanilla is awesome, right? Well, we're going to talk about that. Um, it's okay to learn Christ in a certain way, right? Why go to church? Because it's not just learning about Christ. It's learning about Christ in a certain way, right? Can you do this in your living room? No, you cannot. Oh, yes, I can. So you can be in your living room with all the diversity of different looking people? How are you doing that? Are you zooming them all in? It's just like one of those NBA games where all the cameras are up in the TVs and you can see each other. No. Can you smell smells that a church would bring? You know, to, I don't think so. Are you going to go to that trouble? I don't think so. Are you going to hear the sounds that you would hear when you're at church? No. Are you going to feel that? Are you going to touch people? No. No. So can we do church at home? No. We're going to talk more about it. Um, and, you know, hopefully this just, if, if you're a big churchgoer, this is just going to help solidify helping you talk to your family and saying, look, you need to be in church. Maybe you can direct them to this series, uh, maybe, and help help them uh, to understand. You, you can't you can't do church. You can yes, you can be a Christian and not go to church. Yes, you, you, I'm not saying all people that don't go to church are lost, but you can't live the life without it. Okay, any more than you can tell me that you don't enjoy sights and sounds. If you tell me you don't enjoy any sights, smells, or sounds, okay, I got you then you're not human. And since you're not human, I guess you don't, it doesn't apply to you, right? Does this make sense? Is this helpful in any way? If it's not, guys, tell me, we'll, we'll get off of this train. But when Paul said in Philippians 4, you didn't learn Christ that way, that's why we need to do this study, because there is a way in which we learn Christ, not just what we learn about Christ. Okay, I won't say that anymore. We'll keep going. All right. Any other word? Anything before we go? Sam, good to see you. Glad you're here. Good to see you. Right? I yeah. haven't been to come to church, but yeah. I have an advantage where I live. Yeah. Because we yes. still have a church. That's right. They're having some people this afternoon from Mechanicsburg. That's right. And yeah. Have, they have somebody come on Tuesday to do Bible study. Yeah. So Isn't that interesting? Still in the room. You know? Isn't that great that they would come to your place and have church? And bring you in. Isn't that great? It's a lot of trouble to get in a vehicle and go someplace. Yeah. Yeah, I know. But two or more gathered. They whoever brings people in understands the value of church together. 
right? I'm glad you have that. And I bet you have more flowers than we do. Don't you? Don't they keep fresh flowers around there? And Oh, yeah. Oh, isn't it beautiful? Our, uh, I see them all the time. Our activity director, she, she went to school on this stuff. Yeah, so she, she knows. All the flowers outside. We uh, always. And yeah. then Kroger's, they will have a lot of that. They'll bring a very yeah. big dog flowers. Yeah. Flowers isn't it interesting? The old saying, cleanliness is next to godliness. Isn't that interesting how there's that, if we're going to be a body forever, why would we not connect to God that way? You know, guys, thank you for tuning in and we will see you next time. Lord willing, the creek doesn't rise. If it rises for this old boy, just remember, I'll see you at Jesus' feet right now.